Hello and welcome to Lecture 5 in History 361 at New Mexico State University. Today we're going to be talking about African American life in 18th century North America. And I am Professor Jamie Bronstein. While laborers were in short supply throughout the British colonies by the mid 18th century, Europe's Seven Years' War, which was actually nine years in Europe and, or nine years in the uh, British colonies and seven years in Europe, <clears throat> the uh, dates that you need to remember for the North American colonies uh, for the war are 1754 to 63. Um, this war resulted in a shortage of white laborers willing to come to the colonies, and this increased the demand for enslaved labor. Between 1700 and 1720, approximately 20,000 Africans were sold into slavery in North America. Slave importation rates increased dramatically in the 1740s and 1750s, when more than 50,000 slaves were imported each decade. Slave imports rapidly increased in Georgia after the colony's ban on slaves was lifted in 1751. Before that point, Georgia was home to only 500 slaves. By 1775, the colony's enslaved population had risen to 18,000 people. All right, so in just a 24-year period, an increase from 500 to 18,000. South Carolina also increased its holdings of enslaved people during the 1750s. 56,000 slaves were brought to the colony between 1751 and 1775. The colony's population of enslaved people soared even higher during these years as a result of family formation. Slaveholders in the Chesapeake region relied on family formation to grow their labor force. And as a result, their slave importation rate amounted to less than 1,000 slaves per year by the 1770s. Um, so just to restate this in a different way, uh, the more southerly you go along the East Coast, the more importation there was. Whereas in the Upper South, the Chesapeake, it was more of growth through natural increase. Slave importation rates were modest in northern colonies compared to southern colonies. Between 1732 and 1754, enslaved people constituted 20% of New York City's population and made up one-third of all immigrants in the colony. Similarly, one in five Philadelphia laborers were slaves and one in ten laborers in Boston were enslaved Africans. Massachusetts as a whole saw its slave population increase by 50% each decade between 1700 and 1750. By the mid 18th century, artisans in the New England and middle colonies who had traditionally hired and trained white workers began to train slaves to work in their shops. In the New England and middle colonies, more slaves were increasingly employed in agriculture, doing work that in the past had been performed by white workers. Thus, slaveholders in Narragansett County in Rhode Island became more dependent on slave labor, and farmers in Pennsylvania, northern New Jersey, Long Island, and the Hudson Valley began to import large numbers of enslaved people. In contrast with the Chesapeake, northern colonies could not rely on reproduction among enslaved people. Many slaves in the region were unable to find partners and thus to form families. Low birth rates in the northern colonies forced northern slaveholders to rely on a continuous flow of new slaves from Africa to fill their needs. Prior to 1741, 70% of slaves sent to New York were from the Caribbean and 30% came from Africa. After 1741, these proportions were reversed. Um, <clears throat> let me explain this a little bit. Um, Enslaved people who were brought from Africa, the first place they were normally brought to was the Caribbean. There, people would have the first choice of enslaved people, and the enslaved people who were not sold in the Caribbean would then be brought to the British North American colonies to be sold. The unsold slaves were often 
known as refuse slaves. After 1741, northern slaveholders did not want refuse slaves. Instead, they took advantage of the fact that the British crown had eliminated duties on slave imports and tapped into the market of slaves being imported directly from Africa. Small populations of free people were increasingly dwarfed by massive numbers of slaves imported through the colonies and laws that discouraged rather than um, encouraged manumission. For example, free black populations were extremely small in South Carolina because once a person had been freed, they had to leave the state. They were more common in the North, but they still only constituted about 10% of the region's black population. Large numbers of slaves imported directly from Africa ensured that African culture would make a mark on black culture in the 18th century. And their impact was especially striking in Northern colonies where American and Caribbean born slaves were dominant but was weaker in the Lower South, which had always maintained large numbers of African-born slaves. In the Northern colonies, blacks were set apart from whites, which facilitated the new identity that American-born and African-born slaves forged together. American-born blacks embraced an African identity, which shaped the, num the naming of early black organizations. With the cooperation of New England authorities, Blacks in New England held Negro Election Day celebrations in which African and Puritan traditions were fused to ritualize the election of black kings and governors, as well as to spoof white behavior on official election days. The festivities included elaborate processions and parties. The election of black leaders was semi-serious. Black governors and kings were often African-born men of royal lineage, and many were slaves who served powerful white men. And the slave masters might provide candidates with the food, liquor, and elegant clothing that they needed to, quote, compete for office. All right, so one of the aspects of African-American culture is Negro Election Day. Another was Pinkster. New York still had a lot of Dutch influence. As you guys will remember, it had been a Dutch colony until 1664. African Americans celebrated the holiday of Pinkster after the Dutch name for Pentecost. This involved selecting a master of ceremonies named King Charles from among the oldest black men in the area, and King Charles could order people around for the duration of the festival. There was drinking and feasting and something called the guinea dance and drumming. Historians have pointed out that these kinds of events were not necessarily African Americans adopting European customs, since they featured many elements of celebrations that were common to West Africa. And here, uh, this is a representation in this picture of one of those celebrations, although happening in the Caribbean. So you can see some of the aspects that I think might remind you perhaps of carnival time in New Orleans. Um, people in costume, lots of banners, music, people dancing and marching. African culture also influenced black funeral ceremonies, which white observers didn't understand and considered to be pagan. Black people celebrated their dead with music and song to ease their transition into the spirit world. They also buried goods with the grave Things like food, drink, jewelry, and household items were interred with the deceased for use in the afterlife. African Americans in the Upper South also invoked African cultural beliefs when uh, interring their dead, as well as a sustained belief in West African religious traditions as expressed in quote-unquote conjure practices in North America. These practices fused African traditions, English traditions, and Native American knowledge of botanical remedies. Root doctors or Negro doctors skilled in botanical medicine were sought out for advice when people were sick or when they wanted to have their futures predicted or needed magical charms or potions. Conjure and other African traditions were deeply entrenched in black communities in the Lower South where acculturation was minimal and low slave birth rates encouraged 
the continual importation of African-born people. I should also mention that the English in the 1600s and into the 1700s were into the same kinds of things. People believed in, um, what were they called? Wise women and wise men who understood how to use plant medicines and perhaps how to cast spells. This kind of shades off into beliefs in witchcraft among the Puritans. So we're dealing with societies that are transitioning between a belief in um, the supernatural and a belief in the natural. And it's not just African Americans who are um, experiencing these kinds of beliefs, but also the English as well. The fusion of African and American-born black culture was evident in linguistic patterns that emerged in the Upper South, where blacks spoke English, but also used African idioms and syntax. John Smith, an English migrant, noted that blacks in the region spoke, quote, a mixed dialect between the Guinea and English, which he called Virginian. Similarly, in the low country, that is, um, South Carolina and Georgia, and especially the Sea Islands off of those two colonies. Um, many African Americans spoke a Creole language called Gullah, which blended English with West African syntax and words. And if you're interested in seeing a film that is uh, in Gullah, there's a movie called Daughters of the Dust that came out, I want to say, in the 1990s. And it... Um, it is in Gullah, um, so you could listen to those speech patterns. Afro-Christianity emerged in the colonies despite the dominance of African cultural and religious influence on black communities, and despite slaveholders' reluctance to convert their slaves during the 18th century. The development of Afro-Christianity was partially the result of the Great Awakening, that wave of religious revivals that began in New England in the mid-1730s and spread throughout the colonies. The Great Awakening was a multi-denominational movement. It attracted various Protestant participants, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, Baptists, Methodists, and members of German and Dutch Reformed churches. Some of the new sects that appeared were much more welcoming than the Puritans had been. The Puritans, remember, believed in predestination, that everybody had been assigned, even before they were born, to the category of sinners or saints, and only the saints were saved, no matter what they did, no matter what kinds of beliefs they had, or, and no matter what kinds of actions they took. Um, similarly, the Anglican Church had an emphasis on social hierarchies that really tended to exclude many ordinary people. But newer sects like the Baptists and the Methodists and even the Quakers were much more embracing of uh, various people and much more hopeful in terms of their promise of an afterlife. The Great Awakening fostered the education, conversion, and e eventual manumission or freedom of several notable black northerners. For example, the poet Phyllis Wheatley. She was one of many African Americans who had learned to read and write as a result of the religious revival. Her anti-slavery writings eventually helped earn her her freedom, and her work attracted the attention of British anti-slavery activists. The Great Awakening also moved devout slave masters in the South to take a greater interest in their slaves' religious education, and many freed or manumitted their slaves. Despite the fact that many ministers who were influenced by the Great Awakening um, welcomed black worshipers into their congregations, few directly challenged slavery. For example, the famous Connecticut minister Jonathan Edwards and George Whitefield, who was one of the founders of Methodism, both owned slaves. Both men criticized abusive slave masters but argued that slaves flourished under Christian leadership provided by good masters, and they discouraged slaves from seeking freedom. The Great Awakening took on a different character in the Chesapeake region, where whites outnumbered black slaves. Virginia and Maryland slaves attended revivals and brought their own distinct styles of worship to meetings. 
Presbyterian revivalist Samuel Davies hosted more than 100 slaves at his revivals in Hanover County, Virginia in 1751 and distributed Bibles and other religious materials to African Americans in attendance, which encouraged literacy among these populations. But even though there were some extremely religious enslaved people, including many who could preach, they had to hold their religious meetings secretly because slaves were prohibited from holding public gatherings. One historian has called these multi-denominational black religious gatherings the, quote, invisible institution. Free black preachers were often not allowed to lead public religious gatherings either. John Marant was one such preacher who attempted to share his religious faith with slaves on the Charleston, South Carolina plantation where he worked as a carpenter. But the plantation's mistress forbade him because she believed that Christianity would ruin her slaves. Marant held prayer meetings anyway, and congregants were flogged until, quote, blood ran from their backs and sides to the floor to make them leave off praying. All right, so we begin to see in the 18th century several, several things happening. First of all, um, as a result of the Seven Years' War, fewer uh, white migrants and more imported African slaves a kind of fusion of African and American black culture, the um, invention of various traditions like Negro Election Day and Pinkster, and the importance of religion to the black community during the period of the Great Awakening. Okay, that's it for today. See you in the comments.